whatever it, it believes is necessary for its community. Um, examples of that are on the screen there with sport and recreation facilities, um, tourism initiatives, whatever the council uh, thinks is appropriate for your community. The main bit for, for me tonight is on roles and responsibilities. So here we're going to look at the role of a councillor. We'll also look at the role of the mayor um, and, and the CEO, and we'll show you how it all comes together to provide for good governance. The Act states that the role of council is to govern the local government's affairs and is responsible for the performance of the local government's functions. Um, it also oversees the allocation of local government finances and resources and also determines the local government's policies. Um, the council also has the responsibility to ensure there is an appropriate structure for administering the local government. Important, importantly, it is the council who is the employer of the local government CEO. However, the council has no further role to play in other employees of the local government. It's very important to understand right from the outset. The role of councillors. The Local Government Act clearly prescribes the role of a councillor. This includes, um, as listed on the screen, representing the interests of the community and, as Arthur mentioned, not just your ward but the whole community. You provide leadership and guidance, you facilitate communication and you make decisions. Really important to note that an elected member has no individual powers. The power comes from the collective of a, of a whole council at legally run council meetings. The role of the mayor. The Local Government Act clearly prescribes the role of the mayor. Um, whether popularly elected or not, the role is exactly the same. Um, they lead the council as a team and provide leadership to the community. Um, responsibilities include presiding at council meetings, providing leadership and guidance, carrying out civic and ceremonial duties on behalf of the local government, speaks on behalf of the local government and liaises with the CEO. Again, the Mayor has no individual powers. The functions of the local government CEO can be seen in section 5.0 for one of the Act, and you can tell from the amount of text here on the screen, they're broad in scope. Um, main, the first one up the top, it it's the principal advisor to the council on the functions of a local government. It is notable too that the functions of the CEO cannot be assumed or performed by the council. Um, an important aspect of the relationship between the CEO and the mayor is that they liaise regularly with one another. This ensures the smooth flow of information between the leader of the administration and the leader of the council. The separation of roles and responsibilities. This diagram shows us how it all comes together. The council on, the, on, the, on your right is a strategic decision maker that plans for the needs of the community, monitoring changes to these needs, allocating financial resources and reviewing plans to ensure they remain relevant. It performs this decision making function at formally convened meetings of council where it makes legally binding decisions. On the left there, the administration made up of professional officers that put into effect the decisions of the council and manage the services and assets of the community. Although there is a distinct separation of functions between the council and the administration, great reliance is placed on the ability of each part of the local government to work cooperatively within their functional, functional boundaries to progress the interests of the community and, prov and to provide for good governance. We often uh, talk about board-like behaviour um, there are significant differences between councils and boards. For example, councils are democratically elected, but there are also similarities which can be seen here. Similar structure, they use resources to achieve objectives, um, etc. It's appropriate for good governance principles and practices to be implemented by councils that elected members should be encouraged to develop their capacity to make sound strategic decisions based on board-like behaviour. In, in terms of strategic decision making.
this is one uh, we like, Nose In, Fingers Out, um, which is NIFO, uh, well-known acronym to anyone experienced working with the board. The principle of NIFO is noses in, ask questions, fingers out, do not interfere in operational matters. Um, this is a useful principle for elected members to remember and abide by um, consequences to an elected member of not observing the most important aspect, don't interfere, is the potential to breach the rules of conduct regulations and face an inquiry by the standards panel. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, this is really important. The first thing you are going to do when you're, if you're successful to council and you're elected, um, the first duty you will perform will be the signing of this declaration. It's an important declaration as it's an acknowledgement of your commitment to the local government and the people um, of the district for your term of office. We, I like this one too. Um, on taking office and signing the de declaration, you have uh, committed to represent all of the people of the district and so you owe your loyalty to the local government and you have a responsibility of stewardship to maintain the assets and finances of the local government. That is, you want to leave the local government in a better condition than when you were elected. Um, due to the importance of your office as a councillor and the commitment you've made to the community, it's often stated that elected member cannot wear two hats where the business of local government is concerned. You are an elected member seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Um, and that's the overriding thing you've got to remember. You can't take that hat off. Um, and, on now, and, and there are consequences to that. Um, and I'll look at the rules of conduct regulations now. The declaration that you made earlier also requires that you observe the local government rules of conduct regulations it's therefore important you appreciate and understand the requirement of the rules which cover um, the key areas listed on the screen there. General behaviour, use of information, securing unauthorised advantage or disadvantage, misuse of resources, you can't get involved in administration, relations with local government employees, that means you cannot direct an employee and you've got to disclose interests. A local government also has to have a code of conduct. This is an open disclosure by the organisation um, on how it operates. It provides visible guidance for behaviour. Um, this code is meant, a, a code is meant to complement relevant standards, policies and rules, not to substitute for them. Really quickly, meetings of council. Um, so we spoke about the councils, uh, you know, consist of democratically elected representatives. Um, your, the important work uh, happens at formal meetings with your legal binding decisions and the mayor or president will preside at all council meetings. The ordinary meetings of council are convened, well, at least monthly, you... Monthly. monthly um, to discuss matters of significance to, to your community. So. You know, you'll have issues, policy and strategy, dealing with development applications, major projects, annual budget, um, all the range and scope of services to the community that the city provided, also monitors performance and compliance. Um, there are a number of requirements and skills needed for council meetings. Um, you need to be well prepared, give yourself enough time to read all the council minutes, agendas and attached reports. You'll need to be across your annual budget and, fin and monthly financial management um, reports. Most importantly, join in the debate, um, be an objective decision maker. And I always say, um, prepare to be prepared to influence others, but more importantly, be also prepared to be influenced by others. Um, I'll quickly go through, really quickly, um, important aspects of meetings, attendance. So every elected member have an obligation to attend meetings and you may be disqualified for failure to do so. Um, in respect to a quorum, a minimum number of elected members are required to be pre present to con conduct a meeting. How many councillors have you got? Yes, so you need a quorum of six. Yep. Um, as we said previously, the Mayor presides at the meeting 
and all elected members must vote unless a disclosure of interest requires them to leave the meeting and no vote is to be secret. Um, conduct at the meeting, uh, simple majority decisions. Most decisions just require a simple majority, which is votes that require half of those members present in the meeting who are entitled to vote. There are some items in the Local Government Act that re require an absolute majority. So that's um, a, more than 50% whether people are, are there or not. Um, and a casting vote, if there are equal number of votes, uh, the Mayor um, makes a casting vote. Um, Arthur mentioned standing orders before. Really important standing orders, so you have a local, a local law on meeting procedure. It governs how your meeting takes part, takes place. It is the rules that you operate under. Really important that you read the standing orders when you're elected to council. Um, I actually think there's two things you need to read. You need to read your standing orders and you need to read the rules of conduct regulations because they apply to you. Um, quickly talk about um, qualified privilege. So there's no relevant comparison between the rights of a member of parliament and an elected member of a council. Um, so great care must be taken when you're making statements at a council meeting or in ref in, in regards to the affairs of the local government. I want to quickly talk about declarations of interest as it's important. Um, we previously discussed the expectation of your personal behaviour as an elected member, but there's another category termed personal responsibility where you're directly responsible for assessing whether or not you are conflicted in dealing with the matter before council. It's crucial that newly elected members come up to speed quickly and understand the definitions in respect to declarations of interest. There are three main categories of interest. They are financial interest and includes indirect financial interest, proximity interests and impartiality interests. A financial interest is a person like, is likely to have a financial interest. Um, if a matter to be dealt with by the local government will result in a financial gain, loss, benefit or detriment for, for that person. An indirect financial... Am I up to that? Sorry, I went too far. Yep. Um, so an indirect financial interest is a subset of financial interest. So this can be established by showing that you or a person with whom you are closely associated has a financial relationship with a person requiring a local government decision. A proximity interest relates to an estate or interest in land and the effect on that land due to a change to the planning scheme, the zoning or um, development of adjoining land. And then there's an impartiality interest. So this is defined in the rules of conduct regulations and it means an interest that could or reasonably be perceived to adversely affect the impartiality of the person having the interest and includes an interest arising from kinship, friendship or membership of an association. This slide shows you the consequences of declaring an interest in respect to the different categories. So if you declare a financial, indirect financial or proximity interest, you will not be able to participate in decision making process in any way. Um, if you declare an impartiality interest, you will be able to participate in the debate on the matter and vote at the council meeting. So impartiality is just putting up your hand that you may know someone or you, you may, be, may be perceived to be impartial, but you can still partake. I'll quickly skip through this time commitment that you're going to need to do it as an elected member. You've got lots of council and committee meetings, briefing sessions, reading and preparation and community and civic duties. There's a few challenges with time and interruption and those and the like. <laughs> but there's good. Um, you can meet the challenges. Um, you can contribute to the development of your local government community. You have pr privilege of representing the community and you make important decisions. Um, I just want to focus on this because it is becoming prevalent at the moment. So another aspect of your personal life that may change is associated with the use of social media. 
Uh, many people are active on social media and rely upon it to communicate their thoughts, views, beliefs and responses to contemporary issues. But if you become an elected member, you know, you, this will have to change. Um, you need to keep in mind um, our earlier advice that you're always a councillor for the term of your office and that you cannot wear two hats where the business or local government is concerned. So many current elected members maintain a social media presence and do so appropriately and effectively. Um, they do this by restraining from making negative or denigrating personal comments about any aspect of their role on council. So if you choose to utilise social media, do so by maintaining a positive and informative profile. Um, I'll skip over frequently asked questions. Um, you covered all of that anyway, Arthur. Um, excuse me. I've got too many of these. I'll get to the end in a minute. Resource and training, I'll skip over that too because Arthur at the City of Canning have got a really good training program for elected members. You can, if you're really keen, work your way up to a diploma of local government by carrying out all of that training over a period of time. Um, we at Welga are also available to assist the City of Canning in any way. And thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, um, none of you will know this, but Tony is a Meriden boy and I'm a Meriden boy as well, but I never knew Tony when I was in Meriden. So anyway, um, I'll now hand over to Chris the uh, Deputy Electoral Commissioner from the WA Electoral Commission. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Arthur, and good evening to one and all. Before I um, get into my presentation, the, I just want to introduce Nikki. Nikki was the returning officer at the previous elections at, at Canning. She's also been a state returning officer and uh, has um, agreed to be the returning officer at these elections. So she'll be a key player and I would invite each of you, if you're considering running as a councillor, to approach Nikki afterwards, introduce yourself because she'll also have a thumb drive which she can give you, uh, which gives you a wealth of information about being a candidate. So certainly introduce yourself to Nikki after this session. I'm um, very conscious of the fact that we've got a compressed timetable this evening. This presentation normally takes about 30, 35 minutes. It's the same presentation we're delivering to councils across the state. And so I'm going to run through it a little bit quicker <coughs> and I'm going to miss some things. If you've got particular questions... You can talk into the microphone because we are recording. Oh, OK. All right. I was going to stand out there a bit more. Um, Tony has indicated there's 139 local governments in Western Australia. We've been asked to run 89 of those elections. In some cases, a council may decide for the CEO, such as Arthur, to be the returning officer. Well, quite a few CEOs will say, no, thank you. Um, I've got enough to do and I don't want to get drawn into the, the rough and tumble of politics. Um, so that's one of the key reasons they often ask the Electoral Commission to run the election because obviously we are professionals in running elections and also our impartiality and independence and equity and so on is beyond reproach. Having said that, we those 89 local government elections that we're running comprise 97% of the state's eligible electors. So it's, it tends to be the small shires and the wheat belt and so on who, who don't utilise our services. So we then appoint someone to be a returning officer. So we're, we've appointed 80 Nickies and each of those from Halls Creek in the north to Esperance in the south and all of the metro uh, local governments are utilising WAC services. In terms of the election, the, the key dates, the roles will close next uh, Thursday or this coming Thursday. I beg your pardon. The roles for the forthcoming plebiscite on marriage equity 
we'll close this Thursday at uh, midnight. Now that is proving to be an interesting challenge for us because it means that there are going to be a uh, referendum or survey, postal vote survey, whatever you want to call them, out in, in the traps at the same time as our local government postal packages. Uh, the AEC is handling the roll close for the marriage survey postal vote and that closes at uh, midnight this coming Thursday. And so that may impact a little bit on the speed with which, which we can get the roles to councillors when they nominate. Um, so we're, just, we're working with the ABS and the Australian Electoral Commission on that matter at the moment. But in terms of the roles for local government elections, they close at 5pm uh, Friday the 1st of September. We then, subsequent to that, do a, a merge of the owner and occupier's role, which is maintained by the City of Canning with the state role to make sure there are no duplicates and so on. And from that we get our postal survey. Of the 89 local governments we're running, uh, 85 of them are postal, full postal elections. And so that's where the council, by absolute majority, has made a decision that we'll run our election as a postal election. The other key dates, the nominations will formally open on Thursday the 7th of September. They're open for eight days and then they close 4pm sharp the following Thursday. In terms of the mail out of packages, we will be uh, starting our mail out with the country, the remote country locations first. So they'll be lodged with Australia Post from Friday the 22nd onwards. There's then a long weekend in there as well. And then we start lodging city-based local government packages with Australia Post on Wednesday the 27th. So by the following Thursday, all electors should have received their package by about the 5th of October. Replacement packages, it is a full postal election, so there isn't the situation, the big difference between a state and a federal election and a local government election is if we're running it as a full postal, there's no um, roll up, get your name marked off the roll and get handed your ballot papers. In a full postal election, the ballot papers are issued by a post and therefore if someone says, oh look, the dog's eaten mine or I've lost it, and that I want, to, I want to vote, they are able to get, seek a replacement vote. But firstly, we have to cancel the other vote. They can't be given two votes if they suddenly find their package. So it's a little bit of a process. Some people get annoyed when they, oh, what do I go through all this for? Because they do have to cancel that previous package which has been mailed to them. So that's very important. Right. Statutory adv adverts, we do our statutory ads as required under the Local Government Act in the uh, West Australian newspaper. The first of those appeared last Wednesday, which was uh, relating to the roll close. The next one will appear next Wednesday uh, in the West, and that's about uh, nominations is, is opening, who the returning officer is and things like that. So that'll be in the West Australian next Wednesday. The, so I've just referred to that call for nominations on Wednesday the 30th of August, that's when that ad appears. And then the election notice ad appears on the 20th of September and that's after nominations have closed so that we know which wards and which districts will be contested. And some people will be elected unopposed. We, there's no need to send out a, a postal package if people are being elected unopposed. In some cases, some vacancies may remain vacant, in which case we'll do an extraordinary election sometime after the ordinary elections have concluded. Nominations open. You can start preparing now, but you can't lodge your nomination until such time that they're formally opened. Once you've nominated, if nominations haven't closed and you change your mind, you can withdraw. But once the nominations have closed, you can, and you suddenly decide, oh, this isn't for me, I don't want to run in this election, too late. Your name will be on the ballot paper with your profile and you will be out there. 
So think hard and carefully about don't go into it half-baked. Make sure that this is what I want to do. Because once the nominations have closed, you're in that election. The noms close at 4pm sharp. So if you roll up five past four, you will not be accepted as a candidate. You need to ensure that you have all of the requirements in the hands of the returning officer, in the hands of Nikki, by 4pm that day. You can't say, oh, look, I'll give you the money and the form, but I haven't done my profile yet and I'm, I've got to nip down the road and have a photo taken. Too late. After four, once those nominations have all been processed, uh, Nikki will be doing the ballot paper draw. She'll be at this venue and she'll be drawing the position on the ballot paper. The first name drawn out is the first person listed and so on. On the election day, every uh, polling place has to be open from 8 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening, and that provides, even though it's a full postal election, it provides the opportunity for electors who oh, haven't posted it yet, no point posting it on Friday, it's not going to get there, I can go to the council office, drop it in the ballot box at the council office. It'll also be the situation where some people roll up and say, look, I have looked for it, I can't find it, I don't know what I've done with it, I need a replacement. So those replacements can be issued up until 6pm. After 6pm, Nikki will be taking charge of that count, she'll be opening the ballot boxes in the presence of any scrutineers that you may have appointed to represent you, and then undertaking the five counts. And there are five wards, each with a single vacancy, so it'll be a manual count. In terms of uh, nominating, I'll go through, I won't go through this in detail here. If you are not certain as to your eligibility to nominate, then have a chat with Nikki and, and seek clarification as to your eligibility. But you do need to be an elector of the district. You need to be on a state or commonwealth roll. You need to have turned 18. You cannot be the nominee of a body corporate on the owner and occupiers list and run as a candidate. You can vote as a nominee of a body corporate, but you can't be a candidate. The, you can't be a councillor for ward, barely a ward, and decide, oh, I want to run as a councillor for the Nicholson ward. You can, but you have to resign from that other ward if you've still got two years to run on your term. You can't be a councillor somewhere else and, and say, oh, if I get elected, I'm going to become a canning councillor and I'll do away with my um, uh, Armidale. Doesn't work. You have to have resigned that position. There are a number of, of disqualifications uh, relating to it. Again, if you're uncertain, uh, then seek clarification. But you certainly can't be uh, disclosed bankrupt. You can't be a Member of Parliament, um, and there are a number of other provisions. I, I, I mentioned before that Nikki will be having some thumb drives or USBs available, and they have a wealth of information on them. They have, including uh, our service charter for these elections, which is where we uh, elaborate on our commitments to the various stakeholders, including candidates, and what service you can expect from Nikki and the Commission. But there's also a candidate's guide, a scrutineer's guide, a formality guide to give you clarity as to what would be accepted as a valid vote and what would not be accepted, and the nomination forms and, and so on. So there's a wealth of information, including information provided by the Department of Local Government, um, enclosed on that USB. So have a good look at that. Your nomination consists of a completed, signed and witnessed nomination form, $80 deposit, a profile about yourself of up to 150 words, and they all need, as I said earlier, to need to be in Nikki's hands by 4pm at close of nominations. The profile is a really important part of local government campaigning. It's what most people will make their decision on. Don't decide, oh, look, 
150 words is not enough, so I'm going to start inventing hyphenated words, which I've, I've, the, the biggest I've ever seen was 186 words. Um, and if, if you lodge your nomination five minutes before four o'clock and you, Nick, you don't have time to work with Nikki on getting it down to 150 words, we'll take 36 words off it until it gets to 150. And we have that legal right. Nikki also has the power, if she believes that you've made a false or misleading statement in your profile, she has the power to take it out. So it's, it is an important statement, but it's, it needs to be about you. What do you believe in? What experience and skills do you bring to the table? Most people, and I would recommend you include a photograph, head and shoulders or just head, not like we were sent one uh, last election of a chap who was a kangaroo shooter and he was standing there with his rifle and the kangaroo. <laughs> All right, um, we're going to crop that to just your head. So you might have uh, taken a photo next to Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolly and want to be, have them included. No, it's not going to happen. Now, we would strongly recommend that you use our online nomination builder system. It's a great uh, process which has been continually improved over time. And you go onto our website, find the nomination stage, and you start creating your nomination. You can do that now. You don't have to wait till nominations open. The beauty is that you can go in there and develop your profile over time. It can, you can do it over a couple of weeks. So once you've started that process, you don't have to go through right to the end and leave it to the last moment. You can start filling in the, the form now. You can develop your profile, start loading the photo and see what it looks like and so on. So you go in, you can see here that existing nominations versus a new one. Oh, there you go. It's a bit, it's a bit wobbly now. You, so you, you start filling in all of your details that are required. You write your profile. You load in your photograph. You start filling in the nomination form. All that can be done online. And then once you are ready to meet with Nikki to lodge your nomination, you can't nominate online. You still have to give a hard copy signed and witnessed to Nikki, along with the $80 and, and so on. One, a trick for young players. You'll see on the form it says ballot paper name. If, if you are, your name is Thomas Miller, and everyone knows you as Tom, then you might want Tom on the ballot paper. And that, there's nothing wrong with that. But the, make sure that you put the name you want on the ballot paper on that form, because otherwise we'll take, put your whole name there. Okay? If your name, nickname is Wazza, and everyone in the community knows you as Wazza, and your real name's Michael, 